Max Highlights. Coming up on the show... Savory Safari, the gourmet festival in San Moritz and its culinary highlight. Futuristic feeling, Jean-Marie Massot and his vision of industrial design. Picture perfect, Swiss photographer Michel Comte and his very personal portraits. Euromax Highlights, man, here's your host, Robin Merrill. And a very warm welcome to the show. We begin here in downtown Berlin, which is the home of a very talented comic book illustrator, Marco Djurjevic. Comic book heroes are as popular as ever due to Hollywood movies, but it was the comic books themselves that fascinated Djurjevic when he was growing up. Now he works for the American comic book publisher, Marvel Comics. Not only that, he's hired by them to illustrate the covers, which are, of course, the deciding factor when fans buy a comic. They're courageous, invincible, and fight evil with everything they've got. Comic strip superheroes, the mysterious Spider-Man, the Incredible Hulk, and the brave X-Men. Adored by their fans all over the world for 60 years now. The artist Marko Djordjevic has given the old heroes a new shine. Comics have never attracted as many good artists as they do now. When you look at today's comics and compare them to what was on the market 10 years ago, it's unbelievable. It's finally attractive for real artists to work in this field because they can just go wild. Djordjevic draws up to nine cover pages in his Berlin studio every month. These are then seen and enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of comic book readers. The better the cover page, the better the comic sells. The Berlin illustrator starts by sketching his superheroes with a traditional pencil and paper. With a composition sketch, it's all about finding the mistakes I want to eliminate by the final version. Here, for example, the big problem was there wasn't enough room for the logo. The character's face would have cut into it. So I squeezed the figure downwards to avoid them overlapping. He's already produced over 170 cover pages. When the pencil sketch has been completed, it all goes digital. The preliminary sketch gets colored in at the computer and ends up looking like an oil painting. The artist is currently working on an anniversary edition packed with over two dozen characters from the Daredevil comic strip. A lot of my time actually goes into coming up with the right idea. I spend most of the initial stage, the concept stage, figuring out what I want to do so I can stay focused during the actual work process. Djordjevic taught himself everything he knows. In his youth, he studied dozens of anatomy books. And he didn't attend art school. I feel the same euphoria, the same commitment, the same longing to do the best job possible with each new assignment. He grew up in rural western Germany, but like most of his superheroes, loves living in the big city. Before arriving in Berlin, he drew characters for computer games in San Francisco. In 2006, he was offered his dream job. Marvel, the world's biggest publisher of superhero comics, discovered him on the internet. Country life bores the wits out of me. It doesn't inspire me at all. If you want to see someone go downhill fast, just send me out into the countryside for three weeks. I'll come back completely burned out and completely wiped out. People are fun, and people in urban Berlin really care about being individual and creating new things. And that inspires me as an artist, of course. Meanwhile, the 30-year-old gets fan mail from all over the world. His first art book, 
1984 about his first own comic and his most famous cover pages has just been published. I'm sure it makes you happy when you get to this point and are being honored in a book. I think every artist would agree. A distinction like this is the best thing that could ever happen to anyone. His superheroes have turned Marko Djordjevic into a hero on the comic scene. This summer, he's going to open Germany's first official comic strip art school in Berlin. And now to gourmet heaven in the Swiss Alps, a festival for the taste buds in the ski resort of St. Moritz. There's a very special gourmet safari where for each course you go from one top-class hotel to another. And in every hotel is a different chef, so you're experiencing quite a lot of cooks with lots of Michelin stars and gomio points all in the course of one evening meal. We went along for the ride. <laughs> A dinner put together by five of the best chefs in the world. With the gourmet safari, guests are served a luxury feast they'd otherwise have to take several journeys to experience. The gourmet tour begins in the five-star hotel Kuln with chef François Lamont. He's normally head chef at a restaurant in the French city of Rhin with two Michelin stars. In St. Moritz, he serves the gourmet safari guests his so-called amuse-bouche as an appetizer. Gently heated cheese soup with air-dried beef. It's wonderful. I just had a filled pastry pocket with an excellent sauce. You really get the taste of top-class gourmet cooking. The next course. For the starter, the group heads to the Hotel Kempinski. Here, the Swiss chef Ivo Adam has prepared a squid carpaccio of shrimp oil and rum marinated pumpkin. It's served in the kitchen. We want the guests to see how much preparation goes into a dish like this, how big a team it takes to serve up this kind of thing. I think that should happen more often. While the German gourmets polish off their squid at the Kempinski Hotel, German chef Stefan Steinheuer is busy conjuring up another starter at the Souvretta Hotel. The head chef normally works in a top restaurant in southwestern Germany, where he first created the fish recipe that he's going to be serving today. We're always very confident when dealing with regional produce, ingredients on our doorstep, but then we also have no problem cooking the filet of turbot in a spicy orange oil, or we work with cubeb pepper. For around 240 euros a head, the gourmet tourists can get on board the culinary safari. I read all the information about the gourmet festival and I saw the pictures and now I recognize all the chefs. I have nothing to criticize. It's fantastic. I love it. Next stop is the kitchen of the upscale Carlton Hotel. Acclaimed Hamburg-based chef Thomas Martin is making a guest appearance during the festival. The unfamiliar surroundings pose an additional challenge. To ensure that the diners are satisfied, he goes through the precise arrangement of the dishes with the hotel's chef de cuisine, Alexander Kroll, and his team. It's one of my own dishes, crispy duck, and it's straight from Hamburg. I had the bird brought along. It's roasted and really crispy and comes with classic side dishes. It's a typical example of my cuisine. I've made a breadstick with Szechuan pepper especially for the duck. The gourmet guests are impressed by the side dishes as well. It's very spicy. The red cabbage has so many aromas in addition to the vegetable itself. Absolutely fantastic. The duck was also great, of course, but the red cabbage topped everything. Our fifth and final stop is at Badrut's Palace Hotel. Although the connoisseurs have certainly had their fill, they'll no doubt find room for these desserts. 
You're within these hallowed halls in the kitchens where the real chefs are at work. You wouldn't normally get in here. And that just rounds everything off. A safari for the senses in the middle of the Swiss Alps. The Gourmet Festival provides further proof that Saint Moritz is worth going out of your way for. As a child, Jean-Marie Massot wanted to be an inventor, and in a kind of way, that's what he's become. He's actually an industrial designer with a very inventive mind. He says himself, my role is not to design objects, but to propose life-enhancing strategies. He wants to create things that make life better for the person who owns it. And this he does, using modern technology as much as possible to create elegant, yet practical things. In the artist quarter on the hills of the 20th arrondissement in Paris, a little back courtyard houses the creative studio of French industrial designer Jean-Marie Massot. The 42-year-old is a celebrated designer, but he's never focused particularly on beauty or commercial prospects. The work of a designer or architect doesn't consist of drawing plaster cast seashells or other gimmicks, but to observe how people behave and what surroundings fit that behavior. Massot's best-known design is the green truffle armchair from the year 2005. He created this service for the Japanese company Time & Style. Natural forms and colors are important to him. Massot concentrates on the harmony between humans and nature. I want my designs to reflect competence, comfort, durability, and quality. I'm always looking for what's essential, and I want to leave out everything superfluous. For example, in this armchair. It's simple, light, horizontal, so it has everything essential to an armchair. It's comfortable and at the same time elegant. Since the year 2000, he has run the studio Massot together with architect Daniel Pouzet. The designs are above all practical. For example, his Volcano Soccer Stadium, which is due to be opened this year in Guadalajara, Mexico. The design is based on natural ecosystems, with unsightly necessities hidden inside the grass-covered hill. But the French designer is still seeking investors for his flying hotel. It would transport travelers around the world in a blimp, in an unobtrusive, environmentally friendly way. I tried to find a symbol that says, here, this is in harmony with the world. It's peaceful, large, and light at the same time, like a whale, a white whale. It stands for desire and relaxation at the same time, and not for aggression or power. It's an object that's enjoyable to look at. The French design salon, now Designer Vivre, has just selected Jean-Marie Massot as designer of the year for 2009. Whether he works with concrete, metal, or crystal glass, he seeks to make all his designs natural and durable. I like the natural transients of creatures. For example, how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. In contrast, materialistic transients doesn't appeal to me. I like things that are designed to last. His designs seem to arise on their own. They look as if they flow easily from his pen. Furniture dealers also like Muscle's ideas. The Italian manufacturer Imu was working on new projects with him. I greatly admire Jean-Marie Massot's ability to assemble different components. He's poetic, innovative and very elegant and has a feeling for quality of life. Massot has won several international prizes for these faucets, which he designed for the German company Hans Krohr. Massot wants his clients to consume responsibly. His sculptures of plants are not just pleasant to look at. 
Alors ça, c'est totalement n'importe quoi. Pourtant, c'est essentiel. This sculpture has no deeper meaning, but it is still indispensable. The point here is not functionality, but emotions. It's proof of life, participation in what is vital in our living environment. Environnement de vie. Design is nothing. Life is everything. That is Jean-Marie Massot's motto. He gives a whole new meaning to the word design. Claudia Chisla started her career as a photo model, but found a rather interesting way of getting into the movies, via Bollywood. Here in Germany, she wanders around anonymously, but in India, having now completed three Bollywood movies in 2008, she tends to get mobbed by adoring fans. Indeed, she has a growing fan club on the subcontinent and more films there in the offing. We met up with her in the relative quiet of her hometown in southern Germany. Claudia Chisler in the Bavarian city of Bamberg. Claudia Chisler in Calcutta, India. In Germany, she's virtually unknown, but in India, she's a famous movie star. India is totally crazy. The things that go on there, once you've made one film there, things just start to snowball. You do more and more, faster and faster, go on and on. The people are so friendly too, and show their feelings. It's unbelievable. Her latest film is the gangster comedy 1010, directed by Aaron Paul. It's a typical Bollywood film. Claudia Chisler plays a German journalist hot on the heels of some bad guys up to no good. What is the name of your film? The Monobedona of Park. What do you think has happened here? I don't know, somebody just bit my nose. Now the Indian media is touting the German actress as their star. They like women to be feminine. All the actresses who are successful in India are very pretty, curvaceous and naturally also feminine. Maybe that's why I fit in so well there. Claudia began her career as a model. Four years ago, she moved to Bamberg from Katowice, Poland. Here in Germany, she began to record songs. Through the internet, Chisla made contacts with filmmakers. She got to know Indian film producer Vivek Singhania, who brought her to Calcutta to star in the movie Karma. I've been in contact with him since 2006 and kept emailing him over and over. And then he made a film Karma in 2008. He sent me the script, the contract and so forth. And that's how I got the role, my first role. Yeah, so I got the role, the first role. In Karma, Claudia played a murdered tourist who comes back as a spirit. Even though she was only on screen for 10 minutes, people quickly recognized her talent. She made two more films in Bollywood. In 1010, she even got to sing the title song. The atmosphere on the set was really super and funny. We all ate and drank and joked around together. Still, Claudia is happy to return home to Bamberg for some peace and quiet. The 21-year-old doesn't want to rely solely on her film career, so she's currently preparing for her school leaving exam. Later, she plans to study economics. My career is super, but you have to be realistic. If something goes wrong, then you'll still have an education. No one can take that away from you. In her free time, Claudia loves to ride horses, something she's done since she was 12. Riding helps keep her in good shape. It's also good practice for her role in her next Bollywood film, which starts shooting in March. I always wanted to be in show business, wanted to see myself on the big screen. Yes, I think I'm off to a good start, but you always want more. From Bollywood to Hollywood, that's Claudia Chisla's ambitious goal. She's already signed her first Hollywood contract. Maybe soon she'll be a star in Germany too. 
Finally, a man who's a self-professed lover of risk, and when life starts feeling too comfy, Michel Comte moves on and tries something else. For 30 years now, the Swiss-born photographer has been on a first-name basis with the celebrity set, taking iconic photos of people like Carla Bruni, Charlotte Rampling, Jeremy Irons and Michael Schumacher. Once he had mastered that, he threw himself into photojournalism, working for the Red Cross in crisis regions all over the world. Now, a comprehensive exhibition in Dusseldorf shows both sides of this extraordinary artist. British model Naomi Campbell. Italian actress Sophia Loren. Former Formula One racing champion Michael Schumacher. Top models, film stars and sporting icons all captured by Swiss photographer Michel Comte. He shows the vulnerable side of the world's rich and beautiful. Certain people who have a lot of money, or think they have a lot of money, or pretend to have a lot of money, they have this kind of power they want to use. But there always comes the moment of weakness and even in, in a day, there is a quick moment that you see the weakness in their eyes and you have to catch that moment. A retrospective in Dusseldorf is showing some 300 of his photographs. Images from more than 30 years' work for fashion houses like Armani, Ungaro and Lancome, and magazines such as Vogue and Vanity Fair. Some of the photos, like this one of British actor Jeremy Irons, became icons of portrait photography. I think we're living in a magic world. People walk by and don't see the magic and the beauty. And, uh, you know, there are many, many magic moments. On the lookout for these special magic moments, he also photographed behind the scenes of the glittering world of fashion. Here at Paris Fashion Week, he met designers and top models like Claudia Schiffer. He mixes unobtrusively with the paparazzi, yet is always recognized. The photographer owes his career in the fashion business to Karl Lagerfeld, who gave him his first assignment in 1979. I've known Michel longer than anyone else, and I think he did his first photo for Chloé. At the time, I still hadn't done any photos. It was one of the first photos we ever did, advertising for Chloé. Comte also came to fame through his photos of German seven-time Formula One world champion Michael Schumacher. For eight years, he accompanied Schumacher both on the racetrack and privately. The first time I met Michael, Instead of taking pictures, right away, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning in Silverstone, waited until he came, and I walked the whole track with him and spent an hour before the race uh, talking to him. So, and I went again and again, and it's, it's also you have to gain people's trust. Now the photographer and the racing driver are good friends. Michel had also damals schon. Back then, Michel had a very big name, even bigger than mine. It was a very harmonious situation from the start. But there's another side to Michel Comte. Besides the work for glossy magazines, he has increasingly devoted himself to photo reportage. He covers the world's crisis areas for the Red Cross and has his own water foundation. The Dusseldorf exhibition includes his photos from Haiti and Tibet. He has visited the Himalayan region several times. His photos show the daily lives of ordinary people. Kant finds them just as interesting as celebrities. I don't make any difference. And I meet the gardener or I meet the president of the United States. I really treat them the same. But whether average people or high fashion, Michel Quant's photographs move the viewer. 
Don't forget, if you're interested in seeing any of those reports again, you'll find them on your computer at youtube.com slash Deutsche Welle English. All one word, Deutsche Welle English. That's all we've got time for now, though, so until next time, goodbye. <laughs>